I'm Dr. Scott Lyons, and you're watching or listening to The Gently Used Human. Hey, um, are you angry or uh, annoyed with me or seemingly just unapproachable? Or is that just what your face looks like when things are neutral? Did you know that there's actually a science to the concept of resting bitch face? Like people, scientists, got paid to study this. So let's take full advantage of that research and break down what it is why it happens, and where it comes from. The answers might just surprise you. In this episode, I talk with Dr. Shirley Impelizari, psychologist, author, and self-proclaimed expert and aficionado of the resting bitch face. As trauma experts, we explore what happens when you grow up in a landscape of an emotional desert, and we unpack the connections between neurobiology, attachment theory, empathy, and facial muscles. Dr. Shirley shares her inspiring story of overcoming trauma and rewiring her brain to register and feel a full spectrum of emotions. Dr. Shirley is a clinically trained psychologist with a doctorate degree in psychology from UCLA. She has a successful practice in Beverly Hills, California, focusing on individuals, couples, and families. She has been featured on many shows such as Dr. Drew Celebrity Rehab, The Doctors, Workout, and was also a reoccurring guest expert on the Spanish television show Mejor Today. During her training, she discovered somatic experiencing, a type of therapy that works with the body to heal trauma and chronic stress. Dr. Shirley has published two books, Why Can't I Change? How to Conquer Your Self-Destructive Patterns and Scared Speechless, Nine Ways to Overcome Your Fears and Captivate Your Audience. She also had a podcast for many years with co-host medium Kelly White called Both Sides Now, Two Perspectives, One World. In it, they explored the intersection of psychology and spirituality. All right, let's turn that frown upside down and get this party started. Dr. Shirley, welcome to the Gently Used Human podcast. We are so excited to have you. Thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to be here. Oh my gosh, your excitement is also <laughs> exciting me. Uh, I mean, it's just it, it's ooh. I'm just I'm ooh, I just want to shake a little bit in excitement with you. So, um, I was introduced to you as Doctor Shirley, therapist to the stars, oh. and I started having fantasies about what that could mean. And I just want to share with you some of those fantasies. Okay. Um, so I just pictured you sitting down on like these therapist Freudian couches with like Polaris and Cyrus and the sun and all you know, because the sun is a star for those of you who don't know this. Anyways, astronomy. Anyways, and they are saying things to you like, um, Dr. Shirley, ah, uh, ah. Uh, you just don't even understand, Dr. Shirley. Like, it's so tough. All of these humans down there put so much pressure on me. Like, wherever I go, wherever I land, it's the basis of the outcome of their day. I mean, talk about fucking codependency. <laughs> do, you think, do you think I'm enabling them? Like, this is my fantasy of the reverse of astrology. Like, to hearing all these humans... Talk about astrology, and we never think how the stars feel. We don't. We don't. I mean, you know, I have. Well, I cannot confirm or deny the sun, but you know, he walks in. He's like, "It's either too hot or it's too cold. I'm not working hard enough. I'm working too hard." I mean, they're never satisfied. The the stars are never satisfied. No, no. The sun says the humans are never satisfied. It's either too <laughs> hot. It's either too cold. I didn't come out enough one day because it was cloudy. It's, I mean, I thought it's they wanted. True. I know. So, you know, I try and calm them down. And What do you, what do, you do to calm the sun down? Because <laughs> clearly sing. you do it every day. <laughs> exactly. I These sing. are like the best dad <laughs> son jokes I've ever, I've ever gone through in my life. Thank <laughs> oh, you for that. You see, you're doing your best. Sometimes you're cold <laughs> and you have to retract. And so people are going to get a little cold. That's okay. You are such a good therapist. Well, you know, I try to be. When I, I become a star, <laughs> will you be my therapist? Yes, I will. <laughs> I will. 
<laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I'm so excited. This this is now my motivation in life to get to a certain um a, you know esteem in the world so that I can call you one day and you could be my therapist. <laughs> there now, speaking go. of speaking of therapists, hmm. therapists are pretty fucked up in general. So what got you into therapy? Or as as you once asked me, uh dear Scott, as a therapist, when did you first realize how fucked up you were? <laughs> I think that was the first time we ever met. <laughs> I think so, right? Well, because the day happens, it shows up. Yeah. And, you know, I've always heard that there's certain personality um, traits that attract people into different careers, right? Yeah. And yeah. my whole life, call me a little naive, I thought, well, my life was great. I mean, my parents were great. I didn't go through anything. There was no domestic violence. There was no, no one was an alcoholic. Um, no abuse. I thought, mm. so I couldn't figure out what attracted me to this field other than I was very, very curious about human behavior. Like my favorite color is yellow, obviously. And yours is what? Also yellow now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pick a different color, Scott. Fuck. Gray. I like <laughs> silver, actually. Do you? Okay. Mm. So I always wonder, what makes that difference? Why is my favorite color you know, what makes that difference of people mm. just, you know, in their behavior. And so I thought that attracted me to it. Um, until I learned about attachment uh. and <laughs> neglect. Oh, and I thought, Oh, that's what attracted me. <laughs> because what happened was my family, my dad's an engineer. So that kind of says it all yeah. engineer brain. Um, and my mother was a homemaker. So she was always home, but there was, no interaction, oh. you know, so they were there kind of like furniture pieces and they were, they were kind, but there was no interaction. And like th there, but not there is yes. the phrase I've often heard. Yeah. Right. They're physically. So, so neglect can show up as, you know, the latchkey kids where the parents aren't home because either they have yeah. to work or whatever. My sure. mom was home. It was a home cooked meal every night. It yeah. was the house was always spotless and clean. My dad came home at four o'clock every single day. We had dinner by four thirty, and he was home. It wasn't like he went out or, uh, but there was. It was almost like one of my therapists called it an emotional desert. Mm. Yeah, and I remember I would read. I would sit in a corner in the kitchen by the heating, you mm -hmm. know, grate, and sit on that and read because I wanted to be near my mom. But there yeah. was, you know, and so. So then I realized, you know, and I can't remember who told me, it might have been Dr. Peter Levine, who said, you know, neglect can have worse uh, effects on the psyche than physical abuse or sexual abuse. Not that any of that is anywhere near okay, but there's interaction. And so you uh, must exist if someone is doing something to you. But yeah. when, when, you know, when there's no one there emotionally, then yeah. it's this kind of um, shame about existing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think about, yeah, how an emotional, in an emotional desert, there's not a lot that can grow there. Oh, I love and, that. Oh, well, thanks. I, it's, it's one of, it's, it, we have that on a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's true. It's like, I think so, you know, as trauma has become much more of a common word and a common term, mm -hmm. I think we think about it as like a specific event or an impact of overstimulation. Mm -hmm. And so rarely do we think about it as understimulation or the absence of presence as trauma. Right. Right. Yeah. Because trauma, I think, is still seen as something big, but it could yeah. be small things for a long extended period of time. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. the absence, as you said, of like a consistent presence, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. not knowing that that someone is there for you or, or even they're reflecting back a sense of you. Right. Right. A sense that you exist. A sense you know? that you exist. Yeah. Dr. Alan Shore talks about how in the first year of life, you know, when a mother holds the baby and smiles at the baby and the baby smiles back with the baby, the information the baby's getting is I must exist. Mm. And if it smiles, I must exist and it must be a good thing that I exist. Yeah. But if there isn't that interaction, and, or the mother is depressed, which my mom was, and there's no smiling, then the interpretation the child would make is I'm not supposed to exist, or it's not a good mm. thing to exist, you know? No, 
Can you help explain the sort of science of that? Like, why is why is a smile so important? And how does even a, a, a infant sort of register that on such a, you know, as their eyes are even still developing, how well, are they registering that well, that connection? We, you know, we have this idea that there, that infants, you know, because there's the languaging isn't there, that there's no memory, but a, an infant, mm. even a newborn would never recognize its mother if it didn't have the capacity for memory. It's just yeah. what's called implicit memory. So it's, it's not, um, it's not verbal. You can't have words to it, but it's, you know, but your body remembers it's body memory. Yeah. And it's where that implicit memory is where like how we learned how to ride a bike and we don't have to think about it again or how patterns form even like the place where our survival patterns exist the behaviors exist is in that implicit memory they play out like without us having to think about them just like riding a bike after a while right exactly exactly and some implicit memories um you know they've done research where even as young as two weeks old a baby will turn its face towards its mother's um uh sound you know towards her talking so mm-hmm. there is a capacity for memory. It's yeah. just not encoded in the same way. Yeah. 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 And, and so let's talk more about, you know, this sense of, you mentioned like, I don't have existence. I'm not worthy. I mean, this is like the basis of an existential crisis. <laughs> I mean, from an infant perspective. I have lived in an existential crisis <laughs> my whole life. Okay. I mean, you are the poster child of, of existential crisis. I am. You know, people have this existential, you know, de- fear of death. I'm like, death? Oh, bring it on. I have my existential crisis of why am I here? What's the purpose? What is he? Because it's always felt so, you know, when, when, um, when your wound is existence, it's about existence. You know, yeah. it's, you feel like you, you, you're a burden that you shouldn't, that you don't belong, that mm-hmm. you don't. You know, that there's something, what I felt was that there's something always repulsive about me. And so you go your whole life feeling that. And so it can really do a number on you. I mean, you turn out, and from an attachment standpoint, for the most part, um, you develop avoidant attachment because your needs are just not being met. And so you realize, you know, you got to shut them down and push them to the side. And then as an adult, you become the do-it-yourself person. So mm-hmm. it, to me, it just brought up so much shame or humiliation to have people do things for me. So no, 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 I got it. No, I can do it myself. I can do it myself, you know? So it brings up, I mean, it's, it's like a, a snowball effect. I mean, so, so really we're talking about like the, the science of neglect here yes. and how, I mean, it's, it's incredibly sad. I mean, I, when I hear you talk about it, I mean, I know we're, there's a playfulness to which we're describing it or unpacking it, but it, you know, to, to create or to be in the conditions in which you are born to the world. Mm. And it, as you, we've talked about as an emotional desert or the, it, this neglect in which it, you as a sense of being don't really get the opportunity to grow and, and thrive in a way that feels, gives you that sense of belonging or purpose or meaning or I don't know, presence? How, how else would we describe that, that science yeah. of neglect here? Yeah, because there's something about being seen that can feel uncomfortable. Hmm. You know, there's an enormous sense of pride, you know, in being a loner with neglect or in not needing others or not being emotional. And that was, I mean, that had, had me written all over it, you know, where, oh, I don't need others and stuff. And we're, we're hardwired to connect with people. Yeah. And so you're kind of going against a, a natural, you know, um, your, your own your nature. Yeah. Yeah. But the, I mean, we will talk about kind of the advantages of it, which is kind of a weird word to use for it. One of the advantages, because your emotions are so shut down, you don't yeah. feel them. So you really don't feel yeah. like people on the other end, you know, that have a lot of anxiety, feel their emotions all the time. They're on the surface all the time. You know, whereas with this, you can, I mean, I remember I used to sit for hours and go off in my own thoughts and had the best time of my life, you know, but because you don't feel them, you really don't think there's anything wrong. Yeah. 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 And it's, and you don't even know necessarily that you're not feeling them. Like you don't have that, that other experience. No, it's like, 
you know, I, I recently put on a friend's glasses and I didn't realize how bad my vision was <laughs> until I put them on. I was like, oh, that's that's really informative. And it's the same thing. It's like, until you get out of the emotional desert, you don't know how dry it's been. Yes, that's exactly it. Because you have nothing to compare it to. You have nothing to compare it yeah. to. No, you, you talked a little bit before about like welcoming death. Like... Mm -hmm. How, it, you know, like death isn't the scary thing. Life is when you have had a background of neglect. And can you say more about that? That like, in what way was life scarier than the idea of death? Well, I've always known, you know, even though my dad's an engineer and really kicked my right brain out. <laughs> I mean, you cannot be creative here. And when you're born with, you know, when your needs aren't being met, you do go into left brain mode. So you become extremely logical and, and rational. But I always knew there was something else. I couldn't believe it didn't make any sense in my, in my logical brain that this was it, that who you are, the essence of who you are, it disappears because our heart stops. Because mm. then I would think we'd be more robotic. We'd be more alike, you know. And um, so I've always had that belief, never really a direct experience with it as a, as a child. Um, and then I've had my own experiences of going into really deep meditations and feeling like I've connected with the other side. And it's just this incredible, just feeling of love and connection. Wow. And so, you know, with, with all the painful things in this world, I kind of would rather feel that than this, even though there's very, you know, a lot of enjoyable things in life, of course. I mean, it's amazing to think the, to think of the idea, and I, and I actually can resonate with this deeply, of thinking about death as a resource to make your way through life. Mm. And I, oh, I mean... That is profound. I've never thought about it like that, but yeah. yeah. And as a teenager, and when I was really severely depressed, mm. um, and I, I didn't want to be dead but the the fantasy of death was the thing that could get me through the day wow that is so interesting and you know and i when i worked with pediatrics and with kids and you know like um and they would you know self-harm in in ways that were pretty terrifying for those around them and I would sometimes, you know, explore with them. I'm like, is this a way to get through the day for you? Like the idea that it could, knowing it could end gives you control of how to make your way through this day. Mm -hmm. And because so much of their lives felt out of control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so was that present for you in that way or yeah, different? That's, that's an interesting, um, you know, way to put it and think to say it's this need for control. It's just like, you know, a child and they're not getting their needs met, you know, whether it's because they're being abused or they're, or they're being neglected. You know, uh, Dr. Dan Siegel would say if a child, you know, saw their parents to blame, you know, they would go insane because you mean the two people that are supposed to keep me alive, there's something, you know, there's something wrong with them. Then, you know, the anxiety would just be so much. And so you turn around, there's got to be something wrong with me. And that yeah. gives you a sense of control. If I can figure out what's wrong with me, then mm. I can change and get them to love me in the way that I need them to love me. Wow. And yeah. then, of course, we build these inner scripts to reinforce it. Like, I'm worthless. And here's all the ways and, and the, that the world also sees me that way or reinforces my belief system. Right, yeah. right. And usually kind of it goes to... Yeah, the wounds we can we can kind of talk about like unlovable, feeling lovable or unlovable, feeling worthy yeah. or unworthy, or feeling deserving or undeserving. Well, mm -hmm. with neglect, it's it's goes it's different in the sense of it's about existence. You know, there's mm -hmm. shame to even exist in the world. I remember when I used to go out, like in my twenties, and I would walk into a bar, and men would look at me. I would think that they were ridiculing me. So in my mind, I would think, okay, yeah, I know, I know, I, you know, I look like a clown, stop mocking me. And I thought them looking at me was them mocking me. Wow. Yeah, I was fun. It was a fun date. I, I, I've seen photos of you. <laughs> in the 80s? Yes. In I, the 80s. I, I took the 80s very seriously. 
<laughs> the hair was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would measure it at work. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I can imagine it was uh, challenging to be in relation to you because someone wanted to be in relation to you and it was probably too painful to receive it. Well, I didn't believe it. Oh, you didn't believe it. And yeah. So, you know, a gentleman would ask me out and I didn't really believe he really wanted me to go out, to mm. go out, you know, and what happens is then it turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'd go out with my friends and because of, you know, the way I looked and probably the energy that I was admitting, you know, my friends would always have guys talking to them and no one would talk to me, mm. which for the most part, which would then kind of perpetuate this sense of, yes, it's because I'm disgusting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. When when you say this energy, what what is the energy that you're referring to? Well, it's funny because I've been studying with uh, Dr. Porges, Steve Porges, you know, about the muscles in the face and, you know, how they move and stuff. And another thing, when you were asking about, you know, a child and a mother smiling, you know, a child will, uh, an infant will mimic the mother's face. And so yeah. the more movement the mother has in her face, the more movement the infant has, the smiling mm. the eyes that, you know, uh, the awe. And when there is little of that, then there's not a lot of movement in the face. And For the so baby. Face, right. And that's kind yeah. of how you grow up without a lot of movement in the face. And with, you know, they call it, call it smiling eyes, you know, when you smile and the crease is here and the crease is here. And that, um, to the other person's nervous system, feels safe. Uh -huh. But when there is a face without a lot of movement to the other person's nervous system, it feels threatening. How do parents in LA have babies and so, work with that? And, <laughs> so when I heard that, I thought, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. So the Botox that I'm injecting in my face to look more attractive is actually making people feel danger. <laughs> and so they won't, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. We're all crazy here, you know, because it's, it's, such, it's, a, it's such a dynamic. It's a, it, that's such a complicated situation where it's like to feel, I mean, yeah, we might use filler or Botox, these things that limit the movement of our face so that we have more of a sense of attraction. And yet the consequences of that being it's registered as less friendly. It's less it? friendly, possibly a threat. And that's where possibly they came up wow. when, I don't know if you ever saw the YouTube video of resting bitch face and it was... No. You see, oh my God, it's hilarious. So it's this kind of, they did it as a joke. I don't know if they knew about neurobiology, but they talk about how- I'm sure they did. Right, right. Because <laughs> sure who does it? Right? I know. Well, I mean, everything that we're talking about, everybody knows. Um, so they talked about how when you have kind of a still face, it looks like you're a bitch, you know? And then at the end they say, you know, and, and, and uh, a resting asshole face, you know, to include the men. Yes, the very inclusive. Right, very inclusive, yeah. But when you don't have a lot of movement, it looks like you're not friendly, which yeah. you know, we can use the B word for that. And it really is actually because there was not a lot of interaction as a baby. And wow. so uh, Steve Porges would say, if you look, and I started to do this and it worked. If you look at a picture, like right before you walk into a bar, you go out socializing, you look at a picture that just brings a smile to your face, you know, or a warmness, right? Mm -hmm then your face will, will soften. And so then wow. you're, you will look more approachable to people with a softer face. Can I, can I give, um, can you let me know if this looks softer? No. Oh, no. wow. Okay. <laughs> we're we're going to have to, we're going to have to, <laughs> we have to work on little, that. <laughs> we're going to have to work on that. For those who are just listening. Um, I just smiled. That was my <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we're going to have to do a lot of work on that, Scott. Wow, wow. So what I hear you really like linking is the, the pathway from neglect into what we call resting bitch face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the, the, the emotional desert or the uh, expressive desert of a caregiver creates the expressive desert, so to speak, of the infant, mm -hmm. which then becomes essentially as a child into an adult, you know, that, that, um, that naturally angled down, uh, of the eyes of the, the mouth, which then we, someone registers as possibly, uh, a threat or someone's upset and, and we call it resting bitch face. Right. Right. Somebody wow. made that up as a joke because, you know, there's a lot of people walking out there, you know, like that, that don't have, I mean, you've seen people where they're, 
they have kind of just overall, even if they're not noticing you looking at them, um, mm-hmm. just a softness to their face and other people yeah. that look like they're either really angry or very depressed. And yeah. that is, that's the lack of movement. And so part of what I did when I was, you know, when I found all this out and I was doing work, I would just kind of move my face. So, so my muscles would just get more used to be more fluid. Wow. Yeah. So you were unwinding your resting bitch face. Right. By, it's, by return, like returning to movement. Right. Right. By, by making more movements. And so that would be more, you know, I was trying to rewire my brain actually. What I was doing. Oh, wow. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Did, did that shift at all, like bringing more uh, expressiveness into the muscles of your face? Did that shift the, like the scripts or the inner mentality of around neglect or around existence too? Like when you talk about rewiring, did it change your emotional or psychological state? Yeah. You know, I think so because, um, and it did, I mean, I did a, a lot of therapy to do that. So I think it went hand in hand, and especially when I started to learn about the neurobiology, then I would do it on purpose. But I certainly, I mean, if I remember, if I look back and remember how I felt in my twenties, I feel very different now. Mm. I don't have that same kind of, um, even embarrassment to be seen. Yeah. You know, if I could have walked around in my twenties like this, then I would have. With your hands over your face. Yeah. Yeah. Just to hide hiding myself. or hidden or. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I want to take a moment to give a loud shout out to the Embody Lab, which is one of the most incredible resources for body based and somatic therapies. This show is all about healing, and the Embody Lab does exactly that. Whether you're on your own journey of transformation and discovery or enhancing your skill sets in your career as like a coach or a therapist, a body worker, or really any career where you are supporting other gently used humans, the Embody Lab is your place for deep, inspiring, and impactful workshops, certificates, masterclasses, and an incredible community of like-minded folks. I love the Embody Lab, and so do so many other people that call it a platform to come home to over and over again. The Embody Lab is giving my listeners an exclusive offer, a one-time 10% off code to enhance your embodied well-being. All you have to do is go to theembodylab.com and use the code GENTLYUSE10 at checkout. You know, there, there are these studies that, that show that a neutral face, and I, and I think I found this so interesting, a neutral face is considered unfriendly, where that neutral equals contempt. Yeah, yeah. Where like, and, and it's such like, I mean, I find that so fascinating because I'm like, maybe I don't want to, maybe I just, I'm, cont- I'm fine. <laughs> maybe it's all just I, like even keel. But so the neutrality, we register it so often as that there's something unfriendly or wrong about that person as opposed right. to neutral. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so sometimes people won't approach, you know, people like that. And because you don't know, and you're, you know, it feels threatening, but even for the person themselves, when you said, how do you feel? You know, um, they did research also where they had people hold they have a pen or pencil. Well, the pencil. Yeah. And so it produced a smile and they, they, um, I think named things more positively than the other group. Yeah. It shifted their affect, their, their global affect to feel just generally more happy about things. So, sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to grab a pencil right now and probably do the rest of the podcast with a pencil in my mouth. That's great. Maybe we should both do that. (laughs) <laughs> I'm retraining my brain. There you are. You're retraining your brain. But, you know, the the truth is that you even feel, you know, different. When you said, how does it register in you? You yeah. do feel different from um, when, you know, when you smile and how you yeah. feel about yourself. Yeah. I mean, you know, I remember when I, when I was going through my pretty depressed stage of my life, um, mm-hmm. which was um, 
up until yesterday. And um, <laughs> no, it was like as a teenager, especially. And I remember people saying, just smile, you'll feel better. And it was not quite what I needed at the time because, yeah. I, you know, I did try it and it felt so, you know, the whole idea of fake it till you make it, like fake mm-hmm. your smile till you're happy. Like I, I, it felt so inauthentic. Yeah. So it's this tension to, for me about like asking someone to be inauthentic to their current experience, but also recognizing that literally shifting the musculature of your face um, and, and body posture even mm-hmm. can make an emotional difference in your life. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And I agree with you. When people say, smile, you want to slap them. <laughs> it, it's important to give more information. Like once you find this out, like to me, Figuring yeah. this out for myself and and knowing this opened up my world because this whole time I knew how I felt wasn't kind of, you know, the average, right? I felt like, you know, I was, you know, the, the real life Debbie Downer, you know, but it's truly how I felt. But understanding it, I'll never forget, it was 2008. And I actually start my book this way. And I had taken, you know, we have to get, what is it, 36 hours every two years of continuing education to keep oh, your shit, life. Do we? <laughs> oh, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, um, something like that. <laughs> and it was, I found this trip to Tahiti, and um, you can go with your family because the lectures were just in the morning and then you had the rest of the day to. So I brought my daughter who was, God, I don't remember how she was maybe preteen then. And, um, and I thought, who cares? The instructor, who cares what they're teaching? Who cares? I'm going to Tahiti. I get most of my hours. It's a vacation with my daughter. I don't care. And so the first, I'm sitting in the first lecture and I'm thinking, am I going to go jet skiing afterwards? Or am I going to go? You know? I couldn't care less what he was about to talk about. And it was Dr. Dan Siegel. And he starts, and it was all on attachment. And he starts describing avoidant attachment. And I feel he's describing me. And that's when I started to pay attention. And I thought, what is this? And to have someone share with you exactly how you felt your whole life and not understanding why yeah. opened up my world. So I came back and mm. that's when I started studying, you know, somatic um, uh, with Dr. Peter Levine, somatic experiencing because of trauma is stored in the body. And yeah. then with, uh, uh, you know, Steve Porges, Alan Shore. All about and, and um, Stan Tatkin. He does um, um, teaches couples therapy by looking yeah. at attachment and nervous systems, you know, and how mm-hmm. they react to each other. So, and I just, I, I, you know, it was almost like I discovered myself. It was such an incredible self discovery, which is why I wrote the book. Because I thought if people can understand where their stuff comes from, you don't have to feel so different and so yeah. weird, like there's something wrong with you. I mean, going back for a moment to even you sharing like emotion is stored in the body and, and I, excuse me, trauma is stored in the body. Yeah. And, and for us to remember like trauma is not always about an event. It can be the absence of someone else's presence. So the absence of someone else's presence called neglect also is stored in our body. Right. And I think so often we don't think about that, that yeah. neglect stays in the body as, a, as that desert. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the ways that it shows up because it eventually it affects your, you know, your bodily functions, the way yeah. it shows up with, you know, it might be a little TMI, but is because you, you know, you're, you're kind of frozen in a way, you know, you kind of live in a frozen state. And so it can really start to affect your gastrointestinal because the parasympathetic nervous system doesn't get a chance to come online. Um, and so your digestion gets messed up. You know, the sympathetic nervous system is the social one where you, there's movement and there's also excitement and also when there's fear and anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. And then once that's over, the parasympathetic comes online, which is it's called rest and digest. It allows you to rest and then digest your food because the sympathetic, all the energy in the muscle uh, and the blood is to your big muscles in case you have to fight or take off running. But when you live kind of, you know, in, in those kids also that, that are, um, that there's not a lot of movement, it doesn't mean that inside they're calm. You know, no. they've done studies where their heart is, so it's almost like, you know, pressing the brake and the accelerator at the same time. So the car mm. isn't moving, but it's doing this, you know? Oh my God. 
Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even just the image of that has such a visceral effect. Yeah. I mean, that idea that you're so stuck and revving the engines at the same time. Yeah. That entrapment. Right. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, you, you mentioned a, a little bit before <clears throat> that there are a, like, and I love this, this is a, a very special approach, which is like, what are the positive effects of having had that experience in life? And yes. you know, I think it's a very strength-based approach, which is really, it's very humanizing. It's very special to be like, okay, this shit happened to you and you, f- you adapted in these ways. And that's, that is both sad and what were some of the strengths of that? And so yeah. I'm, I'm curious if we can go back to like, what were some of the, the strengths that you developed out of necessity even? Yeah. Well, you know, they're called like survival, you know, mm-hmm. techniques. and there's always, you can always look at, you know, how it works with you. And then of course, how it works against you. And that's what you, you work on in therapy. Like the person, you know, every profession has its, the person that grew up in a very chaotic and dangerous, you know, childhood, or like a, with a borderline parent, you know, will notice every detail because they have to. And they're the ones that are going to remember everything. Their memory is sharp. Oh, yeah, that happened in, you know, September 9th of, you know, 1993. Um, and they can be the best risk assessors, you know, as a job because you are so trained in looking at everything, right? Well, with someone with neglect, you shut everything down. So mm. it has been helpful. For example, I was on driving to work and usually I'll do, you know, with COVID, since everything became online and on the phone, I will do a session on the phone while I'm driving to my office. And so I think this was last year, maybe the year before I was driving to work and I parked, you know, at a red or I was at a red light and next to me, it was, this was in Beverly Hills and there was a restaurant called El Pasteo. And there was a very kind of one of the first maybe that started all the trend of, of people getting uh, assaulted while eating because everybody was eating in the sidewalks. Hmm. Uh, and um, so I'm in a red light and I'm on doing a session. And all of a sudden I look and I see people standing up, starting to run. And I see a guy punching another guy. And I'm like, oh my God, this is happening right in front of me. And then a gun comes out and I hear gunshot you know, noises. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, that's a gun. They're they're shooting. They're shooting. However, all the while going, oh, and how was that for you? How did you because your client was still on the phone. <laughs> oh my God. Phone. I see the girl. There's a girl that got shot in the leg. I see her fall to the ground because she gets shot. I'm watching all of this at a red light while still on phone with the, with the, with the patient. And as soon as the light turns green, I take off and I did not break. I stayed on the phone. I stayed present to what she was saying the whole time because people who come from neglect are excellent uh, at compartmentalizing. Overriding, under-responding. Exactly. That was happening. And okay, that's happening, but this is happening too. Wow. And I didn't skip a beat, (laughs) you know? So that would, I would say is one of the advantages. (laughs) Has has things like that happened before? Of like these kind of intense situations where you kept your therapist voice? <laughs> well, yes. You know, it, it's it's people who have that survival skill yeah. are great at emergency situations. While I was going to college, I investigated child abuse. Mm. And I used to go out at night because I went to school during the day. And it was the type where you got a call into the child abuse hotline. And I was the first one that went out to see what was going on. And, um, one time I remember I'm trying to work with this girl, a teenage mom, she's holding her baby, her boyfriend had come and I didn't know he had a gun pointed at me. I'm trying to get the baby to safety and I'm just right there and I'm working right there and people are telling me what's going on and I don't care because I'm right here. I need to save that baby, you know? So you're just able to really shut everything down and do what you need to do. Yeah. 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 I can resonate with that. I remember my first, one of my first emergency situations. Um, and I was not, when it was out, I was at a, a hotel actually and having breakfast. And I heard just someone go, help. And it was, they didn't even finish the word and I had ran to find them. And, um, <clears throat> and it was a pretty, it was a pretty bad situation when I got there. 
Mm. And I uh, wasn't able to save the person who had drowned, unfortunately. Oh my gosh. But, Sorry. And, and uh, I had to, I had a class I had to teach. So I left that situation um, and because there was the uh, ambulance had come and, <clears throat> and 15 minutes later was teaching a class. And I remember going after all the class was over, it was like, I don't think this is normal <laughs> to be able to compartmentalize and go teach a three hour class after yeah. Yeah. like yeah. the adrenaline rush of trying to save someone. And then the intense experience of, of not. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, wow. It's, yeah. Wow. So you can relate to, to that kind of that, I guess that survival skill of compartmentalizing of just shutting it yeah. down. I mean, you yeah. shut it down where it's truly not there until you remember, just like you said afterwards, you thought, oh, wait, yeah. that may, this may not be the most normal thing. Yeah. And as a kid, like that, that shelving of an experience of going, you know, like it's, it's called auto-regulation. Like there's a term for it that we go, oh, I, I'm going to compartmentalize this. Um, I'm going to put it aside and I'm going to do some other things that take me away from that, the focus of that. The the problem is, and this is what I came to later as an adult, is that I would never go back to the shelf and pick it up right. and process it or metabolize it. So it just like my shelf got cluttered. Yeah. Yeah. My and and that became one of the ways, you know, that led to my own burnout too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um it was your uh childhood situation also neglect? Oh, it was it was a whole party of different things. I came from a long lineage of of uh, chaos, <laughs> and so like you know, where in um, the, when I was born, there was a pretty uh, severe experience with my mom, and she was in the hospital for I don't know two months or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so like there was you know the, the the i wouldn't call it neglect i would call it like the birth trauma itself created a divide a wall that even if there was the ability for people to be present with me i was too frozen to take it in wow so there was a neglect but it wasn't necessarily because there's an absence of of love right but, but there was chaos amongst you know certainly in my childhood and that chaos reaffirmed that wall that divide which made it even harder to take in things like love. So it ended up being a, 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 a way of neglect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you know, that's so fascinating because it's so true, especially when you really understand the neurobiology, because on the surface, people would say, well, how would the infant know? You know, it's yeah. newborn, right? But, but you knew. And so you right. had to close everything down and, and put like a, you know, um, protective shield around your heart. Yeah. I mean, just because we don't have the ability to recite Shakespeare at one does not mean we don't have our primal instincts that have developed or are in the midst of developing our, our you know, our riding reactions, our reflexes, these, these many of which we're already born with. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, it's that kind of hard wiring to connect. That's an instinct yep. because otherwise if the baby is left, it dies. So that yeah. instinct to connect, you know, uh, Dr. Larry Heller would say, you know, connection, it's, it's like our, our deepest yearning and our biggest mm -hmm. fear. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, and it's, and, I mean, heartbreak is such a good example of that, mm -hmm. um, is that like we are so wired to social bond. It, it's part of our own survival mechanism that we have an alarm system that goes off if social bonds are broken. We call that heartbreak. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's do. painful and it's yes. physically, psychologically painful because yes. it says, Hey, for your preservation, you need to build, rebuild, or find more of those social connections. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Which when you look at life from that lens, you know, because it's like the brain's main goal is to keep the, the, you know, the host alive, right. Survival. <laughs> You yeah. know, when you look at all emotions from that guilt is a survival strategy because to, so I don't go do mean things to my tribe. So I don't get kicked out because if I get kicked out, then I won't see the approaching tiger behind me. So my chances of survival are a lot less. 
So when you look at all emotions, you know, they serve a, a survival purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And which, you know, I think brings us to a, an interesting thing of like, how do you repopulate the emotional garden? If you grew up in a desert, so to speak, uh, like how do you start to add all the colored crayons, Crayola emotions back into the pack, so to speak? I, I mean, like I can say for me, like, I don't think I experienced disappointment until I was 28. The emotion. It's not that I wasn't disappointed. It's that I would just always default to one or two emotions that I had available to me, which was like rage or devastation. I might have had a little flair for the drama. And, you know, so all the. What is that book behind you that just came out that you just wrote? Oh, it did it to drama. Oh, it did it to drama. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and, you know, like, I, I didn't talk about it very much in this book, but that sort of emotional desert that you're referring to, that can show up as only having extreme emotions, like polar emotions, not the subtle variant, like full spectrum that we have as humans of emotions. And certainly, so it looks like you have like little sadness and it defaults to devastation. You have a little annoyance or... And it goes all the way to very quickly to rage. Right, right. And so, like, yeah. you know, that is also an emotional desert. Mm -hmm. Even if you have these extremes, underneath it is actually an absence of the subtleties, the nuances right. that happens in a beautiful garden of emotions. Right, right. I love how you say that. Um, yeah, well, I mean the whole the whole continuum of emotions. Yeah. You're either going from one extreme yeah. to the other, and that's in. There's nothing in between. You yeah. know, I started when I started. I mean, that's where um, my when I started training in somatic therapy, which somatic took me the longest time. It's just a fancy word for body. You know, and once <laughs> I got that, I went, oh, okay, whatever. Let's not be <laughs> over. <yeah. laughs> Calm it down, Turbo. Um, <laughs> so when I started learning, because the body you feel it in the body. And that's how I started to learn emotions, what I might be feeling, you know, yeah. what does sadness feel like? I didn't know. But when I tuned into my body, oh, there was a heaviness in my chest. So mm. maybe I was feeling sad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, many times I would feel like this volcano erupting in my stomach. Oh, maybe I'm angry. Not too sure. but Because I really wasn't. I mean, oh, odd. when I have the volcano in my tummy, I think it's horny. Oh, I, we have could, very, wow, wow. We have very different, it wow. could be. Wow, very could different be. somatic experiences. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and who's to say that it's not that, you know? Um, <laughs> when you start to learn, it's like learning a new language. Yeah. You know, yeah. the language of emotions when you've shut them down. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is, you know, like I, I went, you know that kindergarten chart with the emotions? Yeah. <laughs> like I absolutely went back to that. Like that, that became like, I, I mean, and I still use it. Like I have a huge list of emotions mm -hmm. and I check in with my body and I don't, I'm more tuned to like, like you said, the, the somatic experience of it. Like, oh, there's a heaviness here or there's like a, a stirring or like a sense of being chased, like a chills down my spine. And I don't have necessarily the words for it all the time. So I'll go to that list. And I'm like, oh, what word, if I like read it, resonates with that, like that, those body sensations. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. kind of how I started pairing these, you know, um, words like emotions, like uh, sadness, which I'm like, I don't actually know what that means, mm -hmm. really, because I really only knew distraught. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's and, so interesting how for you, you went, because so many things make such a difference. Temperament, which is the one thing we are born with, yeah. you know, experiences in childhood, other people influencing us, how we can have, you know, that you got to experience at least the high end of emotions, you know, yeah. whereas with me, it was no emotions wow. at all. In fact, sometimes the only way I can, um, now it happens certainly a lot more rare, but before the only way I kind of knew what I might've been feeling is my behavior. So if I immediately, my thought was, eh, no big deal, but I would be crying. I mm. thought, well, maybe I do feel more about this than I 
you know, than I think I do. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'd sit with that to really start to understand how I actually felt, but I couldn't feel it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like there were all these pieces around emotions that were disconnected, like the the realization or the awareness of it, the sensation and the sort of the the feeling base of it. Yeah, like somebody would do something to me and I would think, eh, hey, it's no big deal. But then I noticed myself, you know, wanting to say sarcastic sarcastic remarks or being angry. Mm. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, that meant more to me than I'm actually feeling because mm. then why am I so bothered by it? You know, why, why do I want to, you know, why do I not want to get together with that person anymore? You know, so mm-hmm. my behavior would sometimes clue me in to how mm. I felt. Mm-hmm. I remember um, a long time ago, I, um, you know, Dr. Drew, um, uh, mm-hmm the podcast and I wanted him and he spoke at UCLA once at the attachment conference. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but um, uh, Dr. Siegel would do it every year. And it was three days of like the best of the best people. And one year, uh, Dr. Drew was kind of hosting it. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, you have to, have to, have to interview Dr. Peter Levine on your show. You just have to. And I bugged him so much. He finally did it. So Dr. Drew, you know, before we, before he starts to interview, uh, Peter Levine goes, what's the deal with you? How did you get into this? What, what, you know, why are you so into somatic, you know, uh, therapy and stuff? And I said, well, let me just tell you this. My dad's send off to me when I went to college was study hard and don't get into a relationship because emotions are a waste of time. And I went, yeah, duh, dad. (laughs) And I mean, I believed him. And, and so now you're a therapist. Me, and I'm a therapist, right? And, so, and now so you're a therapist. The original yeah. question: What got me to therapy? Now I think it's quite obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, I can see the trail. But right? it's kind of amazing you didn't end up in engineering. Like it's almost like you went against the upbringing completely. It's like not only did you, it, it's like growing up in a desert, but throwing yourself in grad school into a jungle. You know, it's funny because I still don't, yeah, I mean, I've always, as left brain as I am, I've always hated numbers. I don't understand them. My statistics class, you know, for psychology, I always got a tutor from day first of class, I got a tutor. And I remember one of my tutors said, you know, it's not that you don't get this, it's that you don't want to get this. Oh, (laughs) they read you. Right? Um, so I, I was always more, I guess, into more creative fields and understanding. I think that's what I really wanted is an understanding. And I thought Mm. psychology would be the place where I would finally start to understand. And I did. And at what point was it after grad school, after the understanding, so to speak, like there's the understanding and then there's the actual experience because you can understand an emotion, but that doesn't mean you experience the emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I have to say, I wasn't, I was kind of uh, just very rote in, I didn't understand the complexities of it until that day, you know, in Tahiti on the boat, Uh where Dan started to talk about attachment. And then I thought, oh, wow. And then for years, I studied neurobiology with him and uh, attachment and anything I can get my hands on. And that is when I really understood. When you Mm -hmm. understand how, you know... Uh, the neurobiology of how we react and how we work and the attachment. And then you add temperament to it and all that, then that you really have a sense of, and then there's the spirituality, which I also believe in too, you know? Um, but this part, our human part, you yeah. know, I really got it then. Wow. And um, I was able to just practice so differently, you know, wow. and then got my own therapy as well. I think, that's amazing. And I think one of the things I think about too is like, you know, when I hear the story about your dad of like emotions are a waste of time, I also, I think it's important to understand like what, where did that come from for that person? Or, yeah. And how many generations of, of shutting down mm-hmm. did it take to create that belief system? Right. Right. And, and more so it's like, uh, you know, in shutting that down and and basically creating repression, what is, what happens physiologically, you know, and, and how is that then modeled that, that sort of, that, you know, restraint, that, that repression, that whole pushing down, how does that even allow perhaps someone to show up for another human being? Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It affects all areas. 
And it's unfortunate that I didn't have this learning and this understanding before I had my daughter. You know, I did a lot of repair work um, when she was a teenager, when I learned, you know, about uh, attachment and somatic experiencing and and so on. Um, But you kind of, you you know, you're on, I call it emotional autopilot. You, Mm. You don't know what you don't know. So yeah. it's so important to to learn about yourself before having a child so you don't create like I, I thought I'm gonna do things differently, you know, than of the stuff I knew that hurt me. But then you can kind of go overboard and create similar things in your child, you know, because you've gone overboard to the other extreme. This show is also brought to you by the absolutely stunning and powerful tools of transformation that are created by Omala. Oof, even the name Omala transports you to a place of flow and vitality. These are some of my favorite products ever. They have an amazing color-changing yoga mat that responds to your temperature and presence and reflects back your posture in real time. There's this incredible smelling skin balm candle that heats up to activate all the essential oils and vitamins that your skin has been craving. I mean, look, if I could live in a giant bath of this candle, I would 100% do it. They also have these journals that lead you into profound insight, and then you get to plant those journals to create a stunning flower garden. What? I mean, if that's not deep and inventive, I don't know what is. If you're someone who desires to live a luxurious flow of life and who believes in transformative wellness, then you have to check out Amala. Omala is giving my listeners an exclusive discount to treat yourself to something that is as special as you, boo. All you have to do is go to omala.com, that's O-M-A-L-A.com, and use the code DRSCOTT10 at checkout. And a portion of every purchase goes to an incredible charity. You got this. You know, one of the things I think also is helping understand the value of emotions too. Yeah. Which is like, oh, emotions act as a compass to guide us towards our needs. Like that's one framework. Mm -hmm. And they are body signals. They're Mm -hmm. signals in our being that help guide us. Yeah. And I think when we can reframe them as opposed to like, you know, there is no positive negative emotions. That's such an old school idea. Um, What negative, what positive, what positive and negative is, is essentially, oh, I'm having a emotional response that uh, I want to reinforce. That's what we call positive emotions. And negative emotions mean that they require more energy to action. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. all what a negative emotion is. Like it's yeah. not a bad negative. A negative in this context literally means like if it's a positive emotion, we don't need additional energy. We just keep coasting in the experience. Mm-hmm. If it's a negative emotion, quote unquote, it just means that more energy is required to action change. Mm-hmm. I love that. And that is so true because, because it breaks it down and it doesn't, they don't have to be so overwhelming. Mm-hmm. You know, Jak Pansip, Panskip would say that emotions are just a dysregulation of the nervous system. Mm. You know, when the nervous system is dysregulated and it gives us information mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. about how we might be feeling about something, how we might be interpreting something. And it, we have such a hard time with emotions, yeah. especially, you know, with, with, uh, parents and, and, you know, and not knowing how to do it. So try to shut it down, you know, when all you have to do is just validate, yeah. you know, it's less is more. I remember I was talking to a friend of mine who, whose son was having a really hard time. And I go, all you need to do is validate his emotions. Just say, wow, that must have been hard for you. That must have been sad. That's yeah. it. So he calls me one day and he goes, Cheryl, he goes, it worked like a charm. And I go, what happened? And he goes, I was putting my son to sleep and he was telling me about being uh, you know, bullied at school. And I said, that must have really hurt your, f-. no, his friend had said something to him that was mean. He said, that must have really hurt your feelings. And the little boy goes, grabs his face and goes, it did dad. And he turned around and went to sleep, (laughs) you know, feeling, and that's at the core of attachment, feeling seen. You know, I read this beautiful article about a woman whose son came home and he had been, he had been bullied 
Yeah. And she said, I didn't want to take away his feelings because he was feeling very valid feelings. And when we say things as we learned as parents, like those platitudes, well, you know, you don't want to be friends with them anyways. You're not, you're not dealing with the feeling. And so she said, I just held him and created a safe space for him to have his feelings. Yes. I love yeah. that. And, and that's, that is the essence of what allows someone to then later be able to do that for themselves. Right. That teaches them how to deal with their own emotions, which is yeah. exactly, which is one of, I think is one of the best gifts a parent can give a child. You know, yeah. we, 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 I think we associate the emotion with the behavior. Like so many people are so afraid of anger. It's become like this four letter word, right? And anger is life force energy. If we yeah. didn't have the capacity to be angry, the species would have died out because something would have come at us and we wouldn't have done anything. We didn't fight back. So that's yeah. life energy. I'm saving my life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I like to think about anger as that it informs us like an individual that their boundaries are being challenged or violated. Right. Exactly. Like when, we, when we kind of just put it in the context of what it offers us, it mm -hmm. takes it out of that sort of very like, this is bad. Right. Or the sense of out of control. And if you grew yeah. up with a parent who couldn't control their anger, then yes, anger would be very scary. You know, yep. but anger, I can tune in and go, oh my God, I am so angry right now mm -hmm. and not behave in an angry way if I choose not to, you know, yeah. so the behavior is very different than the emotion itself. And, you know, the neuroscientists say, name it to tame it. So if we name our emotions, we can start to help regulate, Yeah, you know, and we don't have to react. We don't have to act out if that's not the best way to handle it. Now that doesn't mean it's e it's easy. It's very hard to, you know, not react when we're having a deep emotion, you know, a strong emotion, but it is yeah. possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, and you know, as we talk about how do we populate the emotional garden, so to speak, or put all the crayons back in the Crayola box of emotions and have the full spectrum, like just going back and practicing um, each emotion. I know, you know, Bessel van der Kolk, um, who is a, you know, very well-known uh, scientist, body um, keeps a, author of Body Keeps a Score, really yeah. like encourages people to go take acting lessons. And, I, you know, like I went to school for acting and I will say like it was, I contacted things that I was never able to contact before in terms of emotions and, and wow. you really start to build that scale. What's an There's, example of that when you say you contacted things that you had? I think anger that wasn't rage. Mm. I think anger that led to a defense instead of a collapse. Wow. Wow. Um, I think vulnerability. Mm -hmm. That was a big one. I, I, you know, and there's, there's a acting technique that I learned um, because, I mean, sometimes like the pencil example of putting the pencil in your mouth to feel uh, to to have a different affect is mm -hmm. is a is a is a somatic technique that was then um, used, and I believe it came out of Argentina, my home country. Your home country. Maybe you created it. Maybe I did it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this very interesting technique because it's like sometimes um, you know there are acting techniques where you're like imagine a scenario in your mind mm -hmm. and then uh, you know allow yourself to have the emotional response. Well, mm -hmm. that never worked for me because I didn't have a very regulated emotional response to begin with to draw on memories to utilize. Yeah. yeah. But what really worked for me was to create the somatic or body experience of the emotion. And so like with anger, for example, you would uh, do sharp breaths in and out of your nose. You add muscular tension to your whole body. You move your body forward in space your lips get really tight. Are you doing this with me as I say it? Mm -hmm. yes, I am. And, yeah, do it. And then uh, uh, your eyes open, they have very direct focus. Yeah. And you have some tension to your muscles, and then you intensify it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Lean yeah. forward more in space. And then you can start to let your body like take it on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That really works. Yeah. And so, like, you know, there's, you know, there's that, that's for anger. Um, you know, happiness is, uh, what was it? So it's Socratic exhales through your mouth. Socratic is like, um, 
it's like broken up. Exhale is kind of like Santa Claus. Ho, 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 ho. Uh, so it's like Socratic exhales through your mouth <laughs> with big, quick inhales through your nose. <laughs> Relax, kind of floppy body tone. Uh, the corners of your mouth just gently move up. Mm -hmm. Your eyes soften and semi close. Mm -hmm. Your body is slightly forward as you have that jiggle yeah, mm -hmm. to your whole body. And your head is just slightly back. <laughs> and then you intensify it. And it's like, it, and there's a way in which it really elicits mm. that sort of body based feeling of the emotion, which is pretty cool. And we're not reliant on memories because memories get tainted anyways. You know, that's so funny. That's so true. And they're not that, you know, it's the strength is only if you look at, you know, the vagus nerve that connects the brain with the body, you know, 20% of the information goes from brain to body. 80% yeah. of the information goes from body to brain. So you're right. If you're thinking about something, it's only going to allow you to feel it maybe at a 20%, right? Yeah. But if your body is into it, then... Yeah you feel it, you know, it's a lot stronger because your whole body, I mean, I've seen, you can, you can almost, you know, guess, of course, when it's extremes in the body posture of what someone might have experienced. I remember I went to a restaurant and bartender, she must have not been more than 23 years old. Her whole back, the upper part of her back was bent. And, mm -hmm. you know, that could have been, you know, you're, you're theorizing, but that the body is protecting the heart, mm. you know, because it must have been a lot of shocks to the heart, a lot of pain. You know, some people will walk with kind of their shoulders up, and that's a fear response. And it's because what we do when we're afraid, we the whole body moves up to try and look bigger to the predator, so then you don't get killed. I mean, there's like an evolutionary reason for all of that. Absolutely. You know? And so sometimes if the posture is very, you know, unfortunately, um, um, extreme, you can theorize what the experiences might have been or what the overall experience in this person's life might have been. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the body keeps the score. The, <laughs> the, it's embedded, you know, that which is not processed and metabolized is embedded in the musculature and in the, in the structure of the bones even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the fashion, the connective tissue. Right. Like, and that's why, you know, that's why sometimes when you're getting a massage, when the mm -hmm. masseuse touches an area and you might start to feel sad or you start crying and people don't really understand what the connection would be, but yeah. it's touching upon something. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 It's fascinating when you look at it that way, isn't it? It is. So I think with that, we should play a game. <laughs> okay. Okay. And and this is a game I made up called Two Truths and a Lie. Uh-oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's a drinking game, and I'm glad you have your margarita. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Hand. This is not a drinking game. Let's add a little more. <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, you know, one of the things that I – a, a, a body-based therapist, a somatic therapist, I think, you know, they, they're able to really register the subtle cues of the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so they become a human bullshit detector. <laughs> Is that fair to say? Yes. And so I'm going to I'm going to put that to the test here with a game called Two Truths and a Lie. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to read three statements and I would like you to identify what is the lie. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. And uh and if you get it wrong, I will shame you. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> No, I will send you back to school <laughs> for CE credits to Tahiti. <laughs> and I think I'll miss it on purpose. <laughs> okay. First, okay. first statement. Mm -hmm. I once had a chinchilla named Nacho that I stole from the science museum ca camp when I was 11. Okay. That's statement one. Okay. Statement two. Uh, I once won Richard Simmons Dance Contest at the Mall of America, and there is a video on Good Morning America where they zoomed in on my crotch, and then you hear the anchor person go, look at that guy go. <laughs> uh, num number three, the third statement. Yes. I have never seen the movie Star Wars. Hmm. What is the lie, Dr. Shirley? 
I'm going to say the first one was the lie. Okay. And what gives you that sense that it was a lie? There was, um, you messed up on a word at the end. Uh huh. It felt like it wasn't a natural anecdote that you were, uh-huh. you were sharing. Mm-hmm. Quite extreme. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, the winning the contest for the, uh, what was it? The, the Richard um, Simmons Zen contest. I can totally see. That, mm-hmm. I was very mm-hmm. surprised that was the lie. The, the number one is the lie because I was 12 when I stole the chinchilla. <laughs> okay, so it still happened, but the lie was, okay, okay. So you were right. You picked up on the piece where I I um, was lying, which was around the age of when I stole that chinchilla from the science museum. I was freeing it. Um. <laughs> you see, you are a lovely empathic person. You are. I, just- I, I never said I wasn't. Wow. <laughs> you said you didn't have feelings. You oh get- yes, yeah. I recall now saying that. That yeah. was also true. All right. So round number two. <laughs> are you ready, Doc- ready Dr. Shirley? Yes, it's two truths and a lie. Okay. All right. Which is a lie. Number one. I once went and partied in Berghain, the club in Berlin, with mm-hmm. the creator and the director of the movie The Matrix, and I showed off my slow motion Matrix dance moves. That's statement number one. I could totally see you doing that. Number two. <laughs> I cried on my 18th birthday because I realized I was at the cutoff point of being a child prodigy. Number three, I have never had coffee. Which one was it? I'm going to have to say that the lie is number two. Correct. Yes. (laughs) I was a child prodigy, so I didn't have to cry about it. (laughs) (laughs) feel like a child 18 was just <laughs> no i uh I, I believe child prodigy status is something like 16 or something oh okay uh, so that's when i cried i was gonna say so so you're just lying about the date that you cried but you yeah still- i don't know if you're getting the pattern here surely. <laughs> exactly. um, because i thought the first one i could totally see you doing so that i mm-hmm. knew was the truth <laughs> as mm-hmm. crazy as that sounds the second one I could almost see you doing, but there was something about, you know, so it was the age. So you did do it. Mm -hmm. 16 and not 18. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. No. All right. Are (laughs) you ready? Two for two. Yes. Round number three. Okay. Statement number one. Mm -hmm. I once had a very famous celebrity ask me if I wanted to do a line of Coke with them off a toilet seat at a burlesque club in New York. Okay. Number two. I had a wedding in the Catskills for my two dogs and catered it with my favorite restaurant in Brooklyn. And just so I could eat a couple dozen of their famous deviled eggs without judgment. Number three. I went on a date and uh, on that first date, that person proposed to me kind of as a joke, but we ended up getting married. All three of them sound like something you would do. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to have to say number two. Mm, Wow. Wow. You are three for three. Really? I I did not have a wedding for my dogs, although that, that sounds pretty fun. Um, and I did really love the deviled eggs at this place that I was thinking of. Mm-hmm. But yes. Um, correct. So it's interesting how you're trying to, like, you know, confuse the person because part of it is the truth, which would allow you to say it in a more truthful manner. But mm-hmm. only a piece of it is a lie. Wait, are you analyzing me and this game? <laughs> Can you yeah. ever just turn it off? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of part of who I am. Ah, and I love every part of you, including your resting bitch face. (laughs) I've been working on it a lot. I mean, I feel so bad saying this that that my my daughter, when she was little, would say, "Mom, are you mad? Mom, are you mad?" Because I always had the you know 
And so, um, yeah, so I've changed a lot. I've always, I did. I mean, very seriously, yeah. I did do a lot of facial movements. So my face would get used to moving a little bit easier. The Botox doesn't help. It keeps it, you know, a little bit straight. But I always say, give me movement. I don't want to be totally flat. Yeah. But the, if you, it's, it's almost like exercising your body. If you exercise yeah. your face, you, your movements, um, you will just have more movement in your face. Yeah. And so I did that a lot. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I love that. And it's so, it, it gives us all hope. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it gives us hope of just like that if, if, if we have a retching, resting bitch face, yeah. that we can repattern it and, and more of a hope of actually like going, oh, if there was a serious element of neglect, which actually created this, that we can go back and heal that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think that that, and that, that's at the key is, is hope. You know, when I found all this out and I started to understand myself, there was hope. I said, oh, there's a reason for this. Because especially with neglect, it's so yep. hidden because of nothing, because nothing happened. And so it's no. so, you know, um, that there was hope that, that there could be something done. And then when you find out that this whole, that old, you know, saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks was a lie because you can rewire your brain. It just takes, yep. you know, a long time, but you can do it. It just, it really brings up a lot of hope. And I think that's what mm -hmm. people who, you know, feel so desperate. And when you talk about, you know, that, that suicidal ideation, it's because you yep. don't feel hope. I mean, uh, my whole life, I thought that. And I actually, you know, I don't mind admitting it. I attempted when I was a teenager because, yeah. because of that lack of hope. It's, it creates this desperate, you know, this, this despair mm -hmm. that, that there's no hope. And, and so, what I hope in these, th you know, in the, like the podcasts that you do in these talks is to help people maybe feel, you know, recognize themselves in some of these talks and bring some hope. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I love that. And thank you for bringing that hope to this, to this oh, podcast. Thank you for doing the podcast and also bringing that to everyone. Oh, my thank you. Well, <laughs> and I can't wait to party with you in, in yes. LA. Fun. I know with a party with you and all the stars <laughs> <laughs> cannot confirm or deny okay. <laughs> what's what's actually really funny is that um you know like when when I first met you i i I felt such a kinship because there's a way in which therapists I don't know if, if we're expected to, or if there's a way, if there's an expectation that we need to be of like this calm, absolute, neutral, gentle force in the world. Mm. But, and there's kind of a, a void of humor or like the whole gamut of emotions that could come with, uh, at, that could otherwise be there. And so mm. when I, when I first met you, I felt like, oh, it's this permission to actually, I mean, I, I always had like, you know, part of my therapy sessions were, were you know, like a stand-up routine uh, where humor was often brought in and playfulness and, and um, expressiveness. And meeting you, it was really a, an affirmation of like, that's, that is okay. And it's actually really, it's a way of actually witnessing someone too, is to play mm -hmm. humor and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've always used humor in my, in my sessions. And even with, you know, with myself, once I figured all this out, because before you can only imagine how unbelievably boring I was, I mean, it was just nothing. I remember my sister is very, you know, she's an extrovert and very, you know, connecting and social. And I would always invite her to my dinner parties because I thought I could just sit there in a corner and just watch people. I loved people, but not talk. And she was the connector. So I would always mm. invite someone, you know, her there. So she would do that for me. But yeah, so and later I just, I just, when you kind of start to be more flexible in all areas and there's more, there's, there's the, the you know, the, the gray area, the gamut is just so then, yeah. And I've always loved using humor and I caught that about you too. I think the first time you said something and we both cracked up, I said, okay, yes, I <laughs> feel a connection with this person. <laughs> it's, it's true. I, and I, 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 the, one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast even was like, oh, you know, being playful, being silly, being funny is is an entry point. And um, you know, it's funny. I I 
I tend to use some of that once in a while, even on like my social media. And I had someone write to me and start trolling me about like that that's not acceptable, that it needs to be an absolute like kindness, that everything has to be done in an absolute kindness. And it felt very kind of like the shame that I remember, you know, in, in the religious upbringing I had of like, mm-hmm. this is, it has to be, you know, very, very conservative. <laughs> and I was like, no, we're not, we're not robots. Like yeah. I actually really appreciate that playfulness as an entry point and that, um, and kindness isn't always the way that something should be done. Mm-hmm. That that and and the the reason I say that is because we're projecting our idea of what kindness is, our values on the expression of somebody else's boundary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if they grew up in an emotional desert, mm-hmm. uh, or they were never allowed to say no, that feels a little bit assertive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That doesn't feel absolutely kind. Yeah. To get to that point for them is deep healing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the the person who was doing that was sharing so much about themselves. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that was always my response. Thank you for sharing your experience. And they're like, I'm not sharing my experience. I'm telling you what to do. And I'm like, thank you for sharing your experience. <laughs> they're like, I feel like you're deflecting. I was like, I am. Thank you for sharing that experience. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it is, I mean, certainly there's a time to be serious in a time, you know, but uh, but I think playfulness is so important. I actually went to a three-day conference about the neurobiology of play and mm. how important it is and how as adults, we lose it. You know, and play, of course, as an adult looks very different than how we did when we were kids. But even, you know, even um, light banter, even, you know, that's that's play. You know, it's yeah. so important. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of jousting, so to speak, of right. of yeah. jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. important. Mm. Well, thank you so much for being on the Gently Used Human Podcast and sharing oh, your that. gently used wisdom. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me. And this was so much sure. fun. So much fun. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Gently Used Human podcast with Dr. Scott Lyons and friends. Visit GentlyUsed.com for fun extras, including submitting your questions for advice from a Midwestern mom. And don't forget to spill the tea and gossip about the show with all your friends and frenemies. And you know what? Show us some love by giving us five stars and leaving a review in your favorite apps. This helps us connect with all the other gently used humans out there. Oh, and by the way, you look fierce today.